So, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, good Sunday. And uh, those of you that have decided to spend a couple of hours uh, here at Miro to attend uh, this session, you are in the midst uh, of uh, a historical event. Uh, without being rhetoric, uh, it's a unique event, however. It's the first time uh, that such a meeting is organized, uh, and uh, the meeting we organize uh, and uh, you can find again uh, uh, the event uh, in the B2Is. And uh, we have a meeting with uh, the president of ECHO, Paul Folkison. ECHO, if you don't know it, is uh, the European supranational organization uh, that uh, harmonizes and op pr promotes uh, optometry at the highest level. ECHO was uh, set up in 1960, more than 50 years of age. And uh, six countries uh, that created Europe uh, also set up ECHO that created Europe uh, with the Treaty of Rome. So, in such 50 years, uh, it has changed its name and uh, offices, and uh, today they are located in uh, the European Union uh, building. And the talk uh, we're going to have with uh, President uh, Folkson uh, is subdivided into three moments. Uh, first of all, 50 minutes, 20 minutes. We shall show you a PowerPoint uh, presentation, uh, and uh, uh, we'll speak about uh, uh, ECHO's uh, program, uh, what it deals with, uh, the organizational chart, uh, the number of members, and so on and so forth. Uh, his uh, uh, president, uh, uh, and uh, for two years, uh, uh, including 2016. And, uh, after seeing uh, the organizational chart and uh, ECHO's aim, in the presentation uh, you shall see that uh, the two main aims uh, of the organization uh, are dissemination of high-level optometry and European examination. Uh, and uh, as you've seen from the title, today we speak about uh, European examination and speaking about uh, the European examination. Uh, I believe that in the audience uh, we have two types of uh, persons. Uh, somebody might be uh, amazed and astonished. You may be amazed. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, you don't know what the European examination is. Uh, and uh, so we shall speak about uh, the origin of the European examination, its aim, uh, when it was uh, devised. And if you're surprised, uh, we shall tell you why we speak about the European examination uh, considering what happened in the last uh, 15 years. So these uh, will be the two main uh, elements and themes. In the second part, uh, the other half an hour, I will ask uh, Mr. Focus on uh, questions. Uh, having seen the slides uh, before, well, they don't contain some elements, and so I shall ask him uh, to shed light on some points. Uh, and uh, in the last part, we shall have a question and answer session if you want to ask uh, clarifications on the European examination, but also on uh, ECHO's activity. With regards uh, to questions, uh, you have a folder, if I'm not wrong, yes. And uh, the folder contains a brochure, and you can ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, you should write down uh, uh, written questions. Uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, please, I do invite you. Uh, if uh, you write down your questions, uh, and uh, the staff will give me uh, your questions, uh, and I will ask questions uh, to Mr. Folkeson, and then he will answer. One last element before giving him the floor. You see us uh, on the podium. It's two of us. Actually, it's three of us. This is one of the mysteries of behavioral optometry. I'm joking. Uh, it's two of us, uh, but also Mr. Rossetti, 
that is sitting here and uh, together with Giancarlo Montani, Mr. Rossetti will have the freedom uh, to intervene uh, and uh, he's the only one uh, to have such a freedom and uh, I grant him the freedom. I grant him the freedom to take the floor during our talk because uh, Mr. Rossetti was one of the Italian representatives uh, 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 the uh, definition of the European examination, it was 2000. ECHO is uh, 50 years old and uh, the European examination is 15 years old. Uh, after two years of gestation, uh, uh, it took 12 years uh, and uh, when the moment arrived, when the moment arrived, and um, well, uh, um, he was present and uh, he uh, can uh, express his own opinion uh, and uh, he's free to uh, say uh, whatever he wants. At this point, uh, we now give the floor to Mr. Fulkerson uh, and uh, then uh, some questions uh, of clarification and uh, if you want uh, to publicly intervene, if you want to write down your questions, uh, we will have a question and answer session. And uh, if you don't know what ECHO is, uh, we're part of a larger group uh, in Europe. ECHO, ECHO, the European Council of Optometry and Optics, uh, represents all of Europe and Switzerland, Ukraine and Turkey that are not members of the European Union, but they are part of the ECHO organization, and ECHO includes national federations, 42 federations from 27 countries, and um, all of these are part of the board and um, in Brussels. And uh, now Mr. Focusona will give you details, and then some other details, and we will give you the floor if you want clarifications. And. Uh, why do we speak about uh, the European examination? Uh, uh, almost at the end, uh, we shall tell you why. And uh, it's useful to understand uh, how, uh, um, why we deal with the European examination. Thank you so much, Sergio. Uh, and first of all, <coughs> I also will thank uh, the management from Silmo that have invited me for, to go to speak about this ECHO uh, European Diploma. And um, my apology that I don't speak your lovely country's language. It's so nice to listen to, but I don't manage to do this in other words than English. So uh, we are going to speak about the European Diploma and to give you a chance what we are doing in ECHO, I think I would present first of all what ECHO is. ECHO is more or less a... Uh, uh, ECHO is more or less a um, umbrella association. We have members in 27 countries and you see it's 42 members. That means that some countries have more than one member. For instance, in the UK, they have FEM, five member associations. And uh, that's the good thing that we can cooperate in this co EU common. The um, office, the secretariat, is in uh, Brussels. And ECHO is also a member of the World Council of Optometry and the Secretariat for the World Council of Optometry is in St. Louis, Missouri. You see um, the vision for ECHO. The vision is to improve vision and eye health by providing high quality, cost-effective, optometric and optical services across Europe. We have missions, and I would like to focus on the last one. And this is about 
to have some sort of degree, some sort of common standard for optics and optometry, and that's important. Um, this is a try to explain how ECHO is built. ECHO is its members. We have two annual General Assembly, and we have every second year we elect new members to the Executive Committee. The Executive Committee have two thematic committees, and we have the European Diploma Group. And this group is handling with the European Diploma. There is the Board of Management, there is the Board of Examiners, the Board of Examiners, they are independent and they are doing the examination questions and they are assessing the candidates and their performance. And to their help, they have accreditation, accreditation panel. These are the people that go out on the universities and check up the new schools. I just ask interpretation. Am I too quick or too slow? ECHO is dealing quite a lot with consultations. And while we are situated in Brussels, we have almost in the same block as the EU Commission. And we have good contacts with the civil servants at the EU Commission. And that means that we can lobby and we can catch everything that happens in ECHO that would surround us as a profession, as optician or optometrist. This is just to show you what we have done through the last years. I am not going through this, but you can see there's quite a lot of items that we have been managing. To name a few, we have been heavily involved in the fluorescein. You have probably heard about the fluorescein sticks, that they might not be used like they have been. Uh, we are trying to keep them as they have been, because we use them every day in the practices when we fit contact lenses. So we are dealing with that. In the, um, mutual evaluation of profession across borders. We have been very active. And um, actually, <clears throat> the um, commission asked ECHO for statistics and figures because they didn't have any themselves. So we are an important source for the European Commission as well. We have been dealing with the medical device and through ECHO's work, we have now managed to get the Plano contact lenses, the contact lenses without the strength, in the same medical device as the contact lenses with corrective power. You know, this Plano lens, this is the one that you have with colors, and you can look like a cat or a snake or whatever party you're going to but now they are going to be sold in the same way as if they have the strength power. And we have been into the VAT consultation. We are also dealing with uh, the Echo Blue Book. And reason for the name Blue Book is the first edition was blue. So that's the way it has, has been the Blue Book. The Blue Book collects how the profession looks in each country. And in that way, it shows the number and size of profession. It shows the status, the scope of practice, the profession's role in public health, and also the education and training of the profession. And just to give you a Everybody see here. Just to give you a, a thought of how this is one of the pages, and I should say also, the blue book is free downloaded on Echo's website, so you can see it for yourself when you get home to, to your computers. Here out you have all the competencies, what 
the profession are allowed to do in each country. Up here, you have each country, each member country in ECHO. And you can see the green one is what's permitted. The red one is what's prohibited. And the orange is what they are doing. So even if it's not permitted, they are still doing it. And for your country, you have Italy here, and you can follow down here each square marks what you're allowed to do or not allowed to do, or what's practice. But as I say, you can see this on the website under Echo Blue Book. Echo is also a organization with several stakeholders. Up, up. up here, you find ECHO, and this is the AMD Association. This is the European Men's Health uh, Foundation, and this is the International Diabetes Federation. These four forms the European Forum Against Blindness, EFAB, and together with European Guide Dog Federation, Euron One and Euron Contact, IAPB, and all these all together form the European Coalition for Vision. So we are, we are cooperating with many associations, many organizations. So, <clears throat> then we are talking about optometry and optics in Europe. Uh, we have the economic conditions. It, they vary from country to country. This is how it has been in the past. We have the scope of practice. It also varies a lot. We have the education at different levels, from university level to more or less handcraft systems. In other ways, it has been a history of no harmonization. Uh, we can also think about our profession like uh, three different eye care systems. We have the one where optometrists are doing almost everything. They are almost in charge. And that's the situation in UK. We have the countries where optometrists and ophthalmologists share responsibility. That's the situation in Germany, for instance. And we have the countries where ophthalmologists are doing everything, almost, and that is, for instance, like in France. And reason for this is that the extent of available training is, differs. The national law also differs. The organization of profession differs, and also the relative size compared to ophthalmology. Uh, this is to show you how it looks according to the World Council of Optometry when we look on how optom optometric service is provided. From the left you have uh, from the left you have dispensing and this is optical technology service. You have refraction and prescribing and you have screening for eye diseases without drugs and with drugs, and then you can also use diagnostics. And then you have all the ones that are using also therapeutics. If you take the same pillars and put the countries up here and what they are allowed to do, then I think we find Italy here, and uh, you, you're, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we find Italy here. And then we have um, the optometrist doing screening and eye diseases, and then we have the ones using diagnostics. And all the others that also use therapeutics. It's very good to have this picture. <coughs> in your mind when we are talking about education and, 
how we are performing in each country because this is the background to why we are acting like we are. This is the foundation. If you don't have the education, then it's very hard to do a very proper job. So, um, we have been acting on this European Diploma in Optometry and Optics for many years. And we figured out when I met Sergio here in the last days that you have been in this work together with Anto and doing all the questions. And we shouldn't say how many years it was, but it was some years. And it has been a long, long work with this diploma. Um, this is the thoughts about this European diploma, is that we should have a European syllabus. It set out the highest entry level in any country, and it has a strong political value, a very strong political value, professional political value. That is to establish a high standard of opt automatic service and practice and also to have some sort of harmonization in the future. It also promotes the educational value to encourage and arising the standards of education to get them to be all the time better and better and better. And also to meet the requirements from the Bologna Declaration. So this is more or less how the history has been. First steps were taken back in 1988. First examinations around 2000. And then we had a time shift around here, 2008, because we discovered that two less optometrist opticians was examinated for the European diploma. We thought it took too long time, it costed too much money, and we get so less students out through the system. So here we decided to think about, to accredit the universities, the schools. Because when you accredit a school, all the students that have taken that course are also liable for the European diploma. So instead of having a three or five day exam per student, now we can give the European diploma to say 30 or 40 students that, have, that has taken a course on a accredited university. And just to give you a view of what we are dealing with, this is a competency-based European diploma. So the university that will be accredited will have to assure that they go through all these 24 points. And the best thing with this is that if you have one university that is accredited and you have another that also is accredited in another country, then you know that the student have the same uh, studying at each of these two and they have the same exam. So it's a very good thing to have it around these competency-based items. Um, the structure of the European Diploma is three parts. You have the first part, it's about visual perception and optical technology. The second part is about management of visual problems. And the third part is general health and ocular abnormality. And also that should be added with the portfolio of the clinical experience. Shall you take the photo first? Good. Okay, we go ahead. And what is then the benefits of the European Diploma then? It's actually ahead of the time. Before 
the, uh, the Bologna Declaration was set, this was thought through and, and produced. Uh, this system promotes educational development because we see that on each of these schools that we have been through for education process, they have in some areas have to step up. So it also does something with education. It promotes cooperation between educators. It's much easier to lend an educator from one school to another when they are in the same system. It promotes expansion of scope of practice, and that's the political issue. When the students come out in the society and they have this exam, it's much more easy to extend the scope of practice for the profession. So we are working on a long-term basis. And um, it's also recognized by GUC in UK and also, uh, of course, in Switzerland, while they are accredited. So the future should be that it's accreditation for prior learning and also for national qualifications. We set the same standards. It top up examinations and the European qualification in optics will be included in this. And we also get the European platform, a gold standard for education. And that's very important because there hasn't been any gold standards. So um, it's good to say that now we have a common level all over Europe. It is a, also a ladder of qualification. So, why should there be an ad ad accreditation scheme? Um, it, it is <coughs> compared against the same benchmark system. So, when you go through a school for their accreditation, then you go through that they are doing all the same steps all the time. It's accredited by a neutral third part and um, competent authorities in each country might be thinking that this is easier to value because it's the same diploma in each country in Europe, so it's easier to compare. And uh, the institutions are encouraged, of course, to match their programs so they fit in this European diploma. So then you can choose as a school. You can choose to do the full program or you can choose to do just the benchmarking. <clears throat> the full accreditation is that you do the self-assessment. Uh, the form is analyzed and it's recognized preliminary. And then there will be a full visit to the school. And I can say the full visit is not an easy task. Um, I have talked with the uh, schools that have had it and they really have to work it through. But on the other hand, when they are done, they have a very well uh, transparent system. Uh, for the ones that don't want to take the, the whole thing, uh, you can only do the benchmarking. You will, not, you will not be accredited, but you know that you are in the line and you can seek for accreditation later on. And this is just to show uh, how it has been this far. Um, we had a Palakian University in Czech Republic. Um, they are a little on hold now. But um, the Fachhochschule in Northwest Schweiz, Alten, Switzerland, they are accredited. The Buskerud University College is accredited. And the Beuth Hochschule in Berlin is a little delayed, but in on its way. And Karolinska Institute in Stockholm is more or less accredited. And furthermore to this, I know that there is a school in Austria that are going to seek for accredit accreditation. And there is a school in um, Spain, the university in Spain, that are also going to do this. We have a university in Lebanon. 
and this is through uh, Erasmus Plus system. Uh, the uh, university in Lebanon plus two universities in India. Even if India is not in Europe yet, uh, but they are, they, they are seeking for accreditation. And that's good because they have heard about it and I think this could be a good thing for the system here. So I think it's a good way to go. So what is the benefits of the European Diploma then? It compares the own syllabus with the European standard. It's very good for the schools. Uh, it is a educational tool because at the school you are working, you can extend and ex uh, develop the education. Uh, it's a political tool because you show the surrounding world that this profession can do so much more. Uh, as long as we go through the system, we can do so much more. So for the profession, it will increase uh, the syllabus as well. And it will increase opportunity, opportunities to increase the scope of practice, of course. And of course, the students that come out in their daily life, it will increase their situation as optics or optometrists. And also it will increase the freedom of movement. So the thought is that when you have this exam from one university, then you should be able to move to other countries and they should recognize it in the future. We are not there yet, but in the future that is a thought. So why should we bother about this? We are a little more than 900 million people now that are 60 or over 60. And that is supposed to be 1.4 billion in uh, 30 years, uh, 2030. Uh, also in uh, 2004, the share of the population aged 65 plus, it was 16% and in the EU countries. And in 14, it was 18, it has raised with almost 4% in such a short period. And you can see here the share of men and women aged before. This is middle age, when they need uh, reading glasses and all these problems. How it has merged from 90 to 2000 to 2015. You see the growth. So there is plenty to do out there for optics and opti opti optometry. And the more we can uniform and shape up the education, the better it would be for a profession when the students come out and, and for the present profession when they are supposed to work outside the, uh, the lab and the schools. So this is the future for us and we should take care of that. And one way of taking care of the future is to have the best ever possible education and then the European Diploma is one system to go because it's the third party certified so it's very safe in that way. So with that I would like to thank you for listening from this uh, information. You have the um, website in, in there you find also the blue book and you have all the uh, 30 sides something where you can check up how your profession is in one country compared to the other countries in Europe. And also the next meeting for ECHO is scheduled for 19th to 22nd of May and that is in Berlin. And that is a joint venture together with uh, the European Academy. The European Academy is uh, um, an educational tool and its origin from ECHO's education committee. And we created this European Academy. And there, all of you that sits in the audience, you can seek for personal membership. So if you go to that website, you'll also find information about the European Academy. It's mainly an educational weekend with good lectures all the weekend. And the next one is 
in May in Berlin, and you have all the information on websites. So, Sergio, I think that's the that top, uh, top of the um, introduction. Allora, io volevo cogliere questo. I would like to take some time. Ok, fantastico. Questo quarto d'ora in più. So we have uh, 15 minutes time for questions uh, to Mr. Fulkerson. You may have some questions to him because I don't know, but in his presentation, uh, you may have uh, seen some information and you want to ask some questions to him. Una delle domande che qualcuno di voi si sarà fatto è ma uh... So one of the questions you may have is the following one. ECO is an organization that was established uh, uh, more than 50 years ago in the 1960s more or less. And uh, today like in the past uh, well it has become a private association of uh, optometrists and opticians uh, uh, who were passionate and keen on their profession and uh, who privately uh, want to promote a higher level of their profession. So, uh, or is it because uh, ECO is very close to the European Commission in Brussels? So is it because of its location that ECO is a sort of organization of the European Union? So is it a private, has it become a private organization or is it a sort of EU organization as it is located next to the European Commission? And so how can it have an impact on the European diploma? Well, I actually wanted to talk about uh, accredited institutions and accredited universities, but the uh, promotion of uh, uh, optometry in uh, uh, universities, uh, does it depend on uh, ECO because ECO is a private organization or is it rather a public organization? Okay. <clears throat> uh, I will say, as I showed at the first slide, uh, ECO is... Uh, is its members, and the members is the professional associations. And um, the reason that we are in Brussels is that we thought that what's happening in Brussels will in one way or another affect each country in the EU area. Because if there is some legislation changed in Brussels, it will, after some years, also affect each country because we have more or less to follow <clears throat> what they have decided. But um, we are not in cooperation in Brussels because they are totally free from us and we are totally free from them. Uh, the reason is that we are there is that we have the chance to lobby. And that is so important that every time that we catch a question, we catch some sort of changing in a law that could affect this profession, then it's very, very important that we can seek contact with the civil servants in the EU Commission. We can set up meetings with them, we can explain for them, have you thought of this, have you thought of that? It will this will affect the profession in this and this way. So. Uh, we have in quite a short time period uh, became a source for them and it was very obvious when we had this uh, mutual evaluation of profession work 
they actually contacted us from the EU Commission and asked us about statistics, about figures for a profession, because they didn't have any reliable source themselves. And that means that we, in a way, uh, will be found between private interests and uh, society interests, in a way we are in the middle, because we are uh, showing how it looks outside there, at the same time that we are not buyed by any interest groups, because we are not supported by any big companies. We are only supported by the member states, and the member states is only the professional associations. Is that the question? Answer to the question? Oh, okay. Se naturalmente uh, a qualcuno questa è insufficiente. So if you want to have uh, further information, you can uh, uh, ask uh, follow-up questions uh, or you can write me. And then there is another issue that was not uh, uh, written in the uh, slides. As ECO is in between the European Commission and uh, uh, private uh, professional association, How important uh, is the and how significant is the support that ECO can provide to the European profession and through which channel? So, uh, by pushing uh, domestic institutions like the Italian government to exaggerate, or by or through private organizations that in turn will have to put pressure and to push uh, other organizations. Yes, we, we are working in a way that we promote information, we promote all the background material that the uh, national associations need to get in contact with the authorities. That means that we, ECHO, can't go into Italy or Spain or any country and tell them that you should do like this because they should think that we were intervening. So the, the way we work is that through our members in each country, when a task, when a problem occurs, uh, then we are asked by that association and we provide them with all the materials, all the backgrounds that they could have help from because it might be that there has been the same question in another country, and then we can use some of that material and compare it with also the new ones from the present country. So we work through the national member against or with the authorities. Come dico una striscia, se qualcuno... Noi siamo sempre qui, adesso immagino che il traduttore... And then... If you have any further information, uh, uh, you can refer to us. Altra cosa invece è un problema, come dire, di, di tipo più nazionale. And then we have another rather national issue. During the past uh, 15 years, uh, or let's say during the 50 years of uh, uh, ECO, the uh, well, did the ECO board or the ECO commission have any meetings with uh, Italian schools or universities? Did you ever have the chance of meeting them to explain who you are and how we can support them or didn't you have any meetings with them? Uh, not that I know. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> this is, I think this is the first time. Um, we have, of course. Quando vi dicevo che, che è un momento storico e unico. Well, I say that this is a unique history. We have, of course, Federica that has been a member for many years, and um, we have thought that through Federica, this information about the European diploma, this is information about the education system, and so, should go out in the country. So that was my thinking. Uh, L'ultima cosa. 
very last uh, question about ECO and then we can move to the European Diploma. ECO uh, in reality has uh, uh, First of all, a couple of introductory words. Uh, I will try to be brief, but um, as we are all Italians, uh, we are all aware uh, of the confusion on the European, on the Italian markets between eye doctors, uh, optometrists, opticians. In the last pages of the Blue Book, uh, you saw um, basically who does what in Europe. Well, maybe it is not completely updated, but this is more or less the situation. So I have a question for Mr. Falkerson. Concerning this issue, that is, who does what? In, so does ECO prefer a two, three, or a four-year uh, a four-year um, uh, course uh, for uh, optometrists? Do you prefer just one single job, or to differentiate between uh, opti opticians and optometrists? Uh, so do, does ECO has a priority, or is ECO uh, an umbrella organization, uh, and uh, uh, do you simply act as a uh, international organization. Uh, <clears throat> if I understood the question right, uh, ECHO can't say anything about if a university is training in two, three, or five, or eight years. Um, that's the decision that the country has to take. And very often that's the decision that the lawmakers have already done in that country. Uh, if the school system is that it takes five years to get an exam, then the government have decided that through the political way, and, and we can't say so much about that. Um, the thing is that we have tried to do this uh, work with the European Diploma to, in a way, conform the, this, how the students are trained. So. Uh, and this is not doing by ECHO as a situation, it's, it's doing by many teachers employed by the universities. So they have looked at their syllabus, they have discussed what is the best way to go forward, and that has been a benchmark all the time, and that's, that's also the reason why this work has taken so long. But the important thing is that nobody have come from above and pointed the finger that you should do like this. This system has grown up on itself. It, is, it has grown up in different discussions, in different decisions from the universities that this should be the best way to educate to a certain level. So, and, and I think um, the best practice is that this system are self-living, and now we see many more universities that are seeking for accreditation. And I be, would be very happy to have one or two from Italy when I go home in my mailbox to say that we are interested to seek. Because the, the quicker we can go further in this work with more universities accredited, it will be better for a profession. And when the profession is well educated, then it's a more harmonized world. And for instance, up in the north, uh, where I come from, I come from Sweden, we have such a fantastic and good cooperation with ophthalmology. So we have a very close cooperation. And uh, the one that gains from that uh, work is actually the patient, because they are refer to the doctor when needed, and they are getting to the doctor in a very quick time with short waiting lists. So uh, the bottom for that is the good education. Mr. Fox and I just introduced Mr. Uh, Folkesson has already introduced uh, the following topic, uh, European examination. Uh, and. Uh, 
the novelty. We wanted to communicate today, and shown in the slides before, is a possibility to have accreditation of universities. And uh, Anto, here in front, can tell us, in the year 2000, when uh, they organized uh, the so-called engine of the European examination, uh, three days of exam, and perhaps it's five days of exam, 800 questions. Uh, it's a real engine. It's a well-greased uh, engine. <laughs> And uh, at a bureaucratic level, it's a bit cumbersome, however. And uh, in the year 2000, uh, they built this engine uh, with the intention uh, and with the hypothesis uh, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, diploma uh, obtained in Italy uh, could be recognized elsewhere in foreign countries uh, this was a fantastic dream, however, because uh, there was a fundamental variable, national governments, uh, national governments uh, that uh, could recognize uh, the European diploma and let it circulate uh, freely. Everybody said, oh, good idea, work, we worked, and somebody said thank you, and somebody didn't even thank us. And all things considered, this European examination, uh, the dream wasn't fulfilled. Uh, uh, and uh, the speaker didn't tell you something, but I tell you, this uh, European examination uh, was and still is in just three languages. Uh, 27 countries uh, should speak three languages, English or French or German. And it means that Portuguese, Italian, Ukrainian, whether they uh, have the test in that language or they don't pass it. The engine is bureaucratically cumbersome and it's difficult to manage, but you should also know English fluently, fluently, not as they know it. The idea was uh, to, in a way, make available the European examination in the various national languages. And how was it possible? With the, the accreditation of universities. That's uh, the idea of the last few years. So this mechanism is going on. We have seen that so far we have three universities. And all the other universities will have to raise their hands and say, we want to be accredited. I'd like to ask Mr. Focus on something. Sorry. Bene, possiamo riprendere. Well, we can go on. So, how many sessions have been organized to have an idea of the past 15 years? So, the question for you now. In such 15 years, how many examination sessions did you organize and in which countries? And how many students obtained the diploma? and achieved this diploma in such 15 years. To have an idea, a supranational idea of the dream, the dream we worked on in the year 2000. Yes, you got me on the bullseye there. <laughs> uh, that's, that's also the reason uh, that we have done this accreditation scheme, because uh, there was too few students that took the exam. And just for the same reason that uh, Sergio told, there were skills uh, difficulties with language. And each examination of each student was in three parts in several days. So I would guess very roughly that we have about uh, 60 to 90 students that have taken in the old system. And that was also the reason that we started this thinking about 
accreditation of universities because as soon as you have a course accredited, then all the 30 or 50 students that go through that course will also be uh, acknowledged for a European diploma when they take the exam. And that is, uh, in fact, the situation now in Switzerland. Uh, I was at that exam uh, this uh, September, and I believe there were 35 students from the same course that have this European diploma as well at the exam. So we have had a very struggle way until now because it has been so much workload put in and it costs so much money. And when we come to the result that the university are accredited, then uh, they get it aut automatically when they do the course. So we get much more students out and the growth factor is much more positive for the optometrists and opticians to get out with the exam and the diploma. Okay. Visto che siamo as uh, we are 20 minutes uh, from the end, uh, if uh, someone from the audience has questions uh, to ask, I'd like to ask in the meantime one last question. As uh, we have a novelty, it's the first time we speak about it, and we'd like uh, to thank uh, Mr. Folkeson and uh, the organization for inviting him. So, accreditation of universities, and I'd like to ask a question accreditation for just universities, because when we drank coffee, I told him uh, that in Italy, to achieve an optometry diploma, you have universities, but also some schools, highly qualified schools uh, that for some time now, and uh, even uh, for a longer period of time than universities, uh, give an optometry diploma. Provo a parlare lo stesso, si sentite, sì, ok. Eh. I Thank you. Uh, la... So, my question is as follows. As uh, we have highly qualified uh, schools uh, that have been in existence uh, for some time now, and they are older than uh, some universities. If ECHOS in, is, uh, do you just rely on universities or schools uh, that might apply for accreditation? Uh, let's uh, listen directly to the speaker. And uh, a school or a university have to comply with a specific protocol. The syllabus, some steps to be recognized. Uh, you've seen that uh, the Karolinska Institute uh, is uh, still in the process. Uh, even if uh, uh, they play a home game, they are quite stringent and demanding. So if some schools and uh, Italian schools and universities uh, might want to apply for accreditation. For the European examination, uh, what's the procedure to follow and uh, what echoes uh, intention. Uh. So, you have the floor. Um, <clears throat> as long as you remember all the 24 points, the bullet points, about the accreditation uh, and uh, competency-based, as long as you fulfill all these points, we don't have anything to say if it's a university, it's a school, what kind of school it is. As long as you fulfill the training program according to what's told in the slides, it's okay and, and you will go through it as long as you can prove that you, you show this uh, training for each student and they go through it at the same uh, level as on our, at any other schools. So we don't have any objections about what kind of school is? Uh, it's more about a training program. Sì, l'ultima cosa, poi vediamo se qualcuno di voi ha qualcosa da. 
one last thing and let's see if you have something to ask because I forgot about something. Uh, uh, some of you know that in Italy, three years ago, they opened uh, the so-called registry of optometrists. And uh, and uh, we have spoken about uh, accreditation and diploma. So it's similar to what needs to be done to achieve the European diploma, it's to similar procedures. Uh, I don't say they have the same value, but uh, they're quite similar. And I'd like to ask uh, something at this point to Mr. Fulkerson. That registry, that registry, and those that uh, obtained that certification issued by the Ministry of Industry every two years. They had to uh, be certified again. Somebody says uh, three years, three years. Every three years uh, they had to be certified again. And three years means that I certify that today you have certain skills and capabilities, but in three years' time, I want to see if you have those uh, abilities again, because if uh, you do another job, I, the ministry that certified you, I want to see if you have those uh, abilities. It's just like a driving license. Uh, and uh, from time to time, uh, I, they check if I have the necessary competencies. So my question is as follows. When a school or a university obtains this certification and, uh, 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 and uh, is it necessary to have accreditation uh, again after a certain time and accreditation uh, is it issued uh, to the school or to teacher? It's good. Uh, <clears throat> the accreditation system is for the course. It's not about the teacher, not about the school, it's about the course. So it's the course syllabus. And um, uh, actually when, when a university or school have got this accreditation, then we don't right now have any thoughts about to recertify that course. But um, uh, might be it comes in the future, but right now, when you're, once you've got it, then you have got it as it looks now. And this will uh, sustain like that till we find out that we have to recertify it for some reason. But it's, it's uh, mainly, and it's important to say, it's not about the teachers, not about the co uh, schools, it's about the course. Qualcuno ha qualche domanda? No. Anche no. No questions? Okay. It can be two cases. Uh, perhaps uh, what we've spoken about has been of no interest, uh, we've missed the focus, or we've been so clear that we shed light on every type of doubt, and it makes us proud. I believe it's the second hypothesis we've been so clear. And uh, at this point, uh, if there are no questions, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, end the session. And perhaps uh, one last element, uh, if uh, something, somebody uh, has uh, a question to ask. So, now, what should a Lecce University, Lecce is a place in Italy, to be accredited for the European examination, what should it do? raise its end and uh, write to whom uh, submit an application, uh, Mr. Fulkerson, uh, or somebody goes to Lecce to spend a week at the seaside <laughs> and also <laughs> give accreditation. What's the procedure? Because tomorrow morning Mr. Fulkerson goes back to Sweden. If we want to positively use him, uh, we have 15 minutes and then uh, we go home. For the Lecce University, what should the Lecce University do? <laughs> okay, shall I, shall I just take the word out? <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to thank you in, in the audience that you have been listening so patiently. 
I hope it, uh, it has been understandable in my English. Uh, the system, if you are sitting now and thinking that my school, my university should be in this system, because we should be one, one of the first one in Italy, um, you can take contact with our office, the Secretary General, and she will provi provide you with all the necessary documents that, that you need to, to have to take the decision to go further. And you all also will have all the information about yeah. how the accreditation process is. So uh, uh, if you, you, you can leave your business card to me and I promote you with the right address and then, then you have um, the right information from our secretariat in Brussels. Complimenti, che, grazie che avete capito tutto, bravi, grazie.